Good stuff. Thank you guys for leading us. Let's pray together as we enter into the time where we dive into part of what God has to say to us this morning. God, you have already spoken through these words of these songs that have been sung, through the words of those who have shared powerful things that have happened, that happened on the streets and in services. Thank you, Lord, for the students that are sitting here at the front as a demonstration of the way they want to conclude and crescendo this weekend. We thank you also, Father, that on this brand new Sunday that this is going to be the day where you begin a new week. And so it's your day, and so we set it aside, God. It is super for so many reasons. We thank you, God, for the way our culture celebrates something, an exciting achievement athletically. But God, we pray today that you do extraordinary things in our lives and our hearts. And that we could be able to say by the time we leave here today, that all we have is yours. And we ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Hey, you guys can be seated. Hey, good morning. It's so good to see you guys here. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, children of all ages. Hey, did you guys have a good weekend, students? Hey, I want to thank them and our leaders. By the way, those people that spend time with students, man, they are close to God, man. I'm telling you what, absolutely. Some of them are yawning up here. So y'all can pinch each other because you didn't sleep any last night. Some of y'all out there that are not students didn't sleep any last night, but for different reasons. So somebody sent me this thing on my phone today, and it says, uh, so we should be as excited about church as the Super Bowl. You just hear people saying stuff like that. So when your pastor makes a point this morning, you should stand up and pour Gatorade on his head. All right, so I'm going to make five or six points today, so y'all better not be getting me wet because I don't have no change of clothes, all right? I'll get baptized in a couple of weeks for the rest of you when you go into the water. By the way, it's a great time to reemphasize that if you have never gone public with your faith, it's time to do it. It's been time to do it, and the way to do that is through baptism. So there's a place for you to do that on the card that's inside your brand new worship guide. So got a question here for you. Uh, how many people believe today that the, the Falcons are going to win? Raise, or just, woo, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> The Falcons are dying, man, I'm telling you. How many Patriots fans? Pa- Patriots going to win? Oh, yeah, we got some definite Patriots fans over here. They got their jerseys and everything on there. But anyway, so we're excited about that. Here's the day what I hope is going to happen as we begin this series. I hope what's going to happen is that we're going to be able to understand that God has a plan for our relationships. We're calling this series Fixer Upper for a very specific reason. First, because it is a straight-up, rip-off, off-the-television show of Chip and Joanna Gaines fixing up houses on HGTV. Now, how many HGTV fans watch Fixer Upper? All right, good deal. How many of you going like, what is HGTV? Is that CBS or ABC or NBC? Uh, we, you just aged yourself if you've done that. Well, here is the winsome story of a couple of people who are both Christ followers, by the way, and share their lives while they're sharing these stories of renovating people's houses. Well, so as we go through this series, here's what I want you to understand. We're not going to be talking so much about square footage and shiplap and uh, marble. See this? They've even created this whole thing. You don't have a house these days unless you got some shiplap in it, right? If you don't know what shiplap is, you need to watch their show. <laughs> Incidentally, I recommend that you watch their show. It's a lot of fun, and they're a fun family because they have come through things that are things like you come through. There are people like you. They're normal like you and like me. But it's great to hold, uphold winsome people that are out there in the public that have a successful and thriving marriage. And we need to pray for those that God uses in that kind of way. We need to pray for those people that are going to have a microphone thrust into their face before midnight tonight. That somebody will say something else about, about what is, life is all about than just, yes, I'm really good and I deserve to be the MVP. Here's the way you can be the MVP of your very own family, the MVP of your very own life. Here's how you and I can fix up those kinds of relationships in our lives. Now, I'm really excited that students are here today because unless you've broken some laws, none of y'all are married yet. And uh, there are some of those people that are out there in the audience today that I'm doing premarital counseling with right now. And so we go through an extensive practice of premarital counseling here, and nobody gets married unless they go through it. Some people just kind of attempt to go through it and kind of glide through it, and then others that take it seriously, I have found over the long term, have successful and thriving marriages. Marriage is not easy. 
relationships are not easy, but the very first stage, and if you have somebody in your family, by the way, that is engaged to be married, I want to encourage them to watch this message on video, so you can send it, it'll be posted up on YouTube within 24 hours, and it's really important because if I could say five different decisions that every single, single person needs to make before they get married, while they're in the engaging period, these will be the five things that I would say. And so today we want to dive into Scripture and see what Scripture has to say. And if you look on the top of your notes, it says Genesis 28 and 29. You're going like, oh my gosh, we're going to read two chapters of Scripture. No, I'm going to read a lot of it for you, and I'm going to tell you some stories and some of the backstory. We know the stories that we've heard of a man named Abraham. Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac, in basically an arranged marriage with Rebekah, becomes the next heir to God's plan and God's promise. And then Isaac and Rebekah have two children. One is Esau. You can learn more about him later today. We're going to focus on Jacob, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob literally comes out of a context of where his parents' marriage was an arranged marriage. And it almost seems like in this case that there's been some freedom granted for Jacob to go find somebody that is of his own tribe, but somebody also that is not of another specific tribe and race of people. So he's listened to the guidance of his mom and dad. As a matter of fact, the first thing I would say to you today, as you engage, and literally, if if you like somebody, if if you like a guy or if you like a girl, you know, you you got these experiences where you're dating with the opposite sex or whatever, or you're kind of Snapchatting across the room or something like that, then these are the things you need to understand as you get engaged. And I would also say that if if you're out there today and and you say, I wish I had done some of these things, well, you can go back to where you are today and make some decisions to move forward today with the rest of your todays together. But the very first thing I would say simply is this, is be focused before being familiar. Be focused before being familiar. So what I mean by that? Be focused on the kind of person that you are and the kind of person that you're looking for. Now, here's the thing that I want to ask you. Are you going to just take the first one that comes along and just settle? Or are you going to say, I'm going to do the very best that I possibly can to find the best person for me for the rest of my life? Look what the question I have here for you today is this. Do I know what I want? Really? Or am I just settling? Do I know what I want? Say that with me. Do I know what I want? All right, so I submit to you that what you want certainly is going to have something that is attractive to the eye. But I'm hoping also that it's going to be attractive to the heart. It's going to be the kind of person that you fall in love with because of something inside of them as much as what you see outside of them. Now, I want to tell you something. My eyes work fine. I mean, most of us don't want to go marry ugly people. Right? Right? So, so that's the first thing that typically attracts, right? And so when I saw Andrea the first time, I went, mm-hmm. I'll pay some attention to that child. I did. I said that inside of myself. But I remember the day I really fell in love with her was when I saw her holding children at a special Olympics event and saw that her heart cared about the weaker and the smaller things of this life that could not take care of themselves. That's when I really fell in love with her. So what are you looking for? Are you just looking for somebody that looks good? Guess what? One day they're going to be wrinkled and ugly. Or wrinkled and at least changed in appearance. <laughs> Got to be careful because I'm closer to those ages <laughs> than I used to be. So what do you want? Literally, I think every single one of you who are not married and want to be perhaps one day, would sit down and write out and begin to brainstorm everything I want. Here's everything I want. I want to be pretty, handsome, rich, successful, fertile, whatever. Yes, I did just say that. (laughs) Because you should not settle for anything less. Genesis chapter 28, just listen, this is not in your notes today, but if you're following along, you've got your U version open on your app on your Bible app on your iPhone or whatever, you've got your Bible in your lap, you can read along with me. So Isaac called for Jacob. Here's daddy calling for his son. Just like I I would have this conversation with my son who's engaged to be married. And we all have had those kinds of conversations in one way, shape, or fashion. 
and he blessed him. And then he commanded him. He didn't say, son, just listen. If you want to be up for this, if you want to take this suggestion, this will be fine. He says, son, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Paddan Aram to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. He is sending him to family. He is sending him to a group of people that he knows about. He is sending him to make a choice. And he says, don't marry a Canaanite woman. Now, there's a reason for that. And if we had time to go into it in detail today, God said don't mess with them. When they went into God's chosen land and they drove them out when God's people came up out of Egypt, out of the Exodus, they wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, and then they go in. God says don't associate with them at all. Now, there's something interesting here that I want us to understand. We have to be focused on what it is that we want before we become familiar because too often we get really familiar before we ever get focused. Jacob's dad said, don't mess with those that God says don't mess with. And here's the thing. Y'all know and we know who we're not supposed to mess with. It has nothing to do with skin color. It has nothing to do with nationality. Instead, it has to do with the kind of people that will drag you down. God knew, just as Jacob's father Isaac knew, that to associate with those people that were far away from God, as you could possibly get in the Canaanite culture that day, was a bad mistake. So when your dad says, don't, do this, it's not just so you can go, well, I'm going to get away with it. Continue. He says, take a wife for yourself there from your, the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. So he's going to his uncle's house. From among the brothers, the, excuse me, the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. Here's why this is so important. Jacob knows that his future is going to be part of his father's past and part of his grandfather's past. And God literally wants him to understand and to move forward with the idea that your life and your marriage and your relationship is not just about you. It's about who's going to come after you. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Pat and Aram. He, did where his dad, he went where his dad said to go. To Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, he went to the house that God told him to go to. To Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. So here's what he's saying. When you go fishing... Go fishing in the right places. It doesn't necessarily mean you're supposed to go marry your cousin. If you're from West Virginia, you will. I know, I'm sorry. There's a bunch of folks. Second. I can feel the arrows and the daggers of the eyes. Slap your teeth too, don't you? But anyway... Be familiar before getting friendly. Be familiar before getting friendly. You know what that means? It means get to know them. Look, students, when you spy the one across the cafeteria that you think is the one that the Lord has put before you, be familiar with them and find out about them. What do they do? How do they act? How do they treat people of the opposite gender? How do they present themselves? How do they look? And this is not just for them. This is for all of us. Some of you are looking. Some of you are engaged. Some of you have looked, were engaged, were married, and are now looking again because it didn't work. So these principles apply to all of us. Be familiar before getting friendly. Here's, here's the question we need to ask. Do I know what they want? Do I know what they want? And, and for a lot of them, they want just that one thing. People are smiling. Is he going to say it? 
No, it's because for many people it's just that one thing. And it's different from person to person. For some, it is sexual intimacy. For some, it's money. You don't believe that? You see some of these beautiful women married to these ugly old men. I'm serious. She didn't want to marry him for his money, but it's the only way she could get it. Listen, here's, here's a principle. This is not in your notes, but it's good. You need somebody to want something for you as much as something from you. They want something for you rather than from you. When I fell in love with my wife, I didn't just want something from her. I wanted something for her. I wanted to go make a living, have a career, build a house, or buy one somebody else had built already. I wanted to be able to provide for her until death do us part. I wanted something for her. I wanted her to be able to smile. I wanted her to be able to sigh in relief that she's not stretched to the financial max all the time. I wanted that for her. But here's what happened. Then Jacob continued on his journey, and he came to the land of the eastern peoples. There he saw a well in the open country, with three flocks of sheep lying near it because the flocks were watered from that well. The stone over the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and water the sheep. Then they would return to the stone, its stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob asked the shepherds, My brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they replied. He said to them, Do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? He's like, Man, I've found the right place. I have found the right well. I'm getting ready to find the right girl. Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked them, Is he well? Politically correct, Jacob is. He could be diplomatic. Sometimes he could be a liar, but sometimes he could be diplomatic. Like a lot of politicians we know. Yes, he is, they said. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. This is verse 7 of chapter 29. Look, he said, the sun is still high. It is not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and take them back into the pasture. We can't, they replied, until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. When Jacob saw Rachel's, excuse me, when Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Now I want you to get this, girls. They said that the stone was big, and he sees his cousin coming, and he's got a glimpse of her in the distance. And so Jacob did what guys do. He started showing off. Me, Jacob, move big stone, get girl. Mm. That's exactly what he was doing. He was moving it out of the way. He was also doing it to show that he was willing to work in front of a woman that he potentially was going to marry. Ladies, all you girls down here, all those of you who ain't put a ring on it yet, all those of you that are out there that have had a ring on, now the ring is off again. Before God gave Adam a wife, he gave him a job. Before Jacob was able to begin courtship, he was willing to show he was willing to work. Don't you go hanging out with some dude kind of like, hey, baby, you're going to take care of me one day, aren't you? You need to run from a lazy man. That's what Jacob was doing. He was showing off. And, and then look what happens here. He knew who Rachel was. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. Y'all going like, man, I like what the Bible is teaching about. 
He didn't even say hello. He just went in. No, here's what it means. He engaged in a proper Jewish kiss with a cousin. Perhaps it was one of those French kisses, not like the ones you call French kisses, but one of those <laughs> places where they kiss each side of the cheek. He was being respectful. And he was so excited. He was so overcome with emotion, he started crying. Man, this could be a Hallmark Channel movie. He kissed her, and then he cried. Oh. So I heard it. Some of these girls down here, it came out of them. They didn't even know. Oh. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebecca. So he ran and told her father. He runs to Uncle Laban because he wants to marry this girl. He's gone fishing in the right place. Number three, the third decision we need to make before engaging is be friends before becoming lovers. Be friends before becoming lovers. Oh, man, the, the best marriages I know are marriages where people knew each other long enough to be focused on what they want, wanted, to be familiar with the things the other person wanted, to literally become friendly with that person. And they were friends before they became lovers. Here's the true test, by the way, when you know you're with friends. I, let me just give you a true test for marriage. For all those people that are here that are growing up and prepared to be married one day, is the true test of the person you want to marry or spend your time with is do I laugh with them? All those people in the room, look at me. Am I right? Can I laugh with them? My wife doesn't laugh with me as much as she laughs at me. <laughs> look at that idiot. <laughs> Being friends before becoming lovers is really important. And, and here's, here's the thing that a lot of you need to understand is part of the reason things bust up is because you drew together physically before you became friends. I spoke with a couple, one of the couples that are in the pipeline to get married here later on this year. And it's evident because of the way they sat next to one another across from me in a Starbucks. They laughed together and they poked fun at one another. That, that, that they were friends. Before they ever became people that love one another or had entered into love physically and intimately. So here's what happens. Jacob goes to Laban. He says, I want to marry Rachel. And Jacob kind of goes, well, I'll just kind of give my daughter away. You have to work for it. I'm just it's a Ray Hardy paraphrased version. So how long? Seven years? Seven years. Hey, girls, don't marry a guy unless he's willing to wait for you for seven years. <laughs> Guys, don't marry a girl unless she's worth working seven years for. You're going like, come on, Pastor Ray, this is the 21st century. Guess what? This is two centuries before Christ, so we've had 4,000 years to learn this lesson. Listen, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. You talk about a line. Hey, baby, I've already worked seven years for you. Now, if you're getting married less than seven years, you need to turn to him right now. If you're in this audience and say, I would work seven years for you. But I can't wait. Fourth decision, talk fiscal, meaning money, before talking physical. You need to be singing a new song. Back in my childhood, we had a song, let's get physical, physical. Oh, y'all heard this too. Okay, that's good. <laughs> They've remade it. Somebody's dubstepped it, right? Let's get physical, whatever. Talk fiscal, talk money. You, know you know what Jacob was willing to do? He was willing to say, I want to pay the price to have your daughter as my bride. 
I'm going to show you I'm willing to work and move the stone. And then I'm willing to show you I'm going to work for seven years to get you. So here's question number four for the person you're thinking about engaging with. How do they view money? Let me just tell you. That's really, really important. Here's what typically happens. A free spirit who spends money like it's, it's printed on a HP copier marries somebody who's a nerd who knows where their first penny came from and still has it tucked in their top drawer. And then they drive each other crazy for the rest of their life because they can't get along. You need to talk the money talk. Incidentally, if you are married, you need to be having the money talk regularly. Not, did you pay the bills? Yes, good, thanks, bye. <laughs> how, how are we spending our money this month? What, what, are our, what, are, what are the things we're focusing on? Are we staying according to plan or are we getting out of plan? Instead of going to buy some big expensive toy, oh, I forgot to tell you, it only cost $7,000. Talk fiscal before getting physical. Here's why. People will use you to get what they want and not necessarily what God wants. And then finally, the final thing I would say to those that are interested in getting engaged is to get fixed before getting physical. By getting fixed, I mean this. Put one of these on it. Chip and Joanna Gaines were friends. As a matter of fact, I just got through listening to their uh, audio book called The Magnolia Story. I love listening to the books audibly. As a matter of fact, they read this book and have a back and forth dialogue. So you want a good book to read, to invest your time about looking toward what it means to have a good relationship and having goals and succeeding in the American way, but also, more importantly, in the godly way. Read this book. It's a good one. But they talk about the time that they spent with one another and how they literally protected themselves for one another. Back to our story. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed. This is seven years later, by the way. And I want to make love to her. By this, he doesn't mean... He means getting physical. And it's good. It is a good gift of God. Sex is a good gift of God when it's inside of God's boundaries. But outside of those boundaries, when we step outside of those boundaries, there are all sorts of consequences that I don't have time to go into today. Question number five. How many rings should be on it before we get it on. <laughs> How many rings should be on before I get it on? That's an easy question. Two for you girls and one for him. Two for you and one for him. Oh, come on, Pastor Ray. We live in the 21st century. Yeah, and this book started back in two or three centuries B.C. And it's God's wisdom to us. And he says, stop, wait. As a matter of fact, I, I sometimes I ruin the, 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 the lines, and I don't ask them what their sexual practices are, but when people come and step before me and they say that they're uh, engaged and they want to be married, I say, well, here's the deal. I don't want to know about your sex life, but you're having sex. You've got to stop if you want me to marry you. <laughs> and here's why. Here's why. Because you want to know that person loves you because of all the things I've said previously, you're focused on what you want. You're familiar with them. You're friendly with them. You can laugh with them. And so I say, here's what will happen. If you stop, if you already are physically intimate, if you stop, you'll really find whether or not you're in love or not. Or if you just want to use one another. But some of you, man, I'm married, dude, and I already stepped across that line. Or I'm, I'm 13 or 14, I already stepped across that line. Then stop and wait for that place where it's going to be most special. So what's the point today? Engage wisely to engage well. Let's pray. 
Father, I pray that you would help us to do all five of these things. Particularly for those that are at this stage where they're engaging or seeking to be engaged. Help us never to settle. Instead, help us to go for what is your best for us. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Perhaps today there are those people here that have made decisions to follow Christ. Even while we're sitting here. We start talking about this stuff and you say, you know what, I, I want that way he's describing. Or maybe you're one of those students this weekend that said yes to Christ. I encourage you to go outside to the folks in the red balloons. They are going to share with you some materials and things that will help you to grow as a Christ follower. Perhaps today your guest, make sure to take your first, second, or third time guest gift card up to the, the place outside. We want to make sure to give you that. If you're wanting to hang out for a while, grab a cup of coffee, have a conversation with others. The other thing I want to point to is this, is that we, we want you to get involved in group life. And there are, there are group catalogs that have been in your chairs. There are places where we've talked a lot about it. And, and we want you that more for you than from you. There are people that are out there by day of the week that are waiting in the lobby to build in the community. But I want to put a hard pause and a hard stop on what we've been talking about right now. And I want to be your pastor for a little while. And I specifically want to begin this part as we conclude today. I'm going to say a few things. I'm going to show you a video. I'm going to issue a challenge. And then we're going to leave. I challenge, first of all, the American people to remember that the authorities over us are over us for a reason. Whether their name was Barack Hussein Obama or Donald John Trump. Obey the rules of society. And follow the leaders. Secondly, I would suggest to those individuals, those presidents who have helped to preside newly or formally over the national and international tragedy of millions of people. Being blown out of their home because of the ego trip of a ruler. Here's what I'm going to challenge them to look at. I'm going to challenge them to look at this video, just as I challenge you to look at this video. كيف النوب يصير ضرب والعالم يركب تموت وشي عالم محترى هاي العالم ما تهيت من الحرب ومن الضرب صرنا صرنا أنا 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 صرت نادي له يا أبا كان في أخواتي وأنا والبابا والماما هم هم بسوريا بخاف يموتوا اسمها الله أنا شفت صاروخ يوم قام ينزل جيتي هيك تسبب هيك جبنا غزيتة وقام بين أخذنا لمطرح بعيد يتجي طيار يقع عليهم البيت احلى شجر وبحياتي يعني شفته والعصافير والكيل والهاي لبس البيت يعني هلا الطيور بتصب بالجو ملك على الطاميون السجر يبيس ملك على الشارون يعني انا اول شيء هيك مثل الحلم يعني انا هلا متى يعني شفتها هيك مثل الحلم يعني شيء يتجي عليهم الطياد يقول عليهم شي شي تصفن باوصان إلي مش شايفة عبير سنة ورجع على بلدي وعلى المدرسة على رفاقي حاسة لا ماشي بس بس وقت أهلي هيك هيك تأثرت علي كتير أه حبوني ولا بحبوني كتير We're not going to wait for the government to do something. World Vision has been there for years. When I met their president, Rich Stearns, years ago, he said, God in some way will judge the actions of what we do in this generation. 
by what we do with those children are displaced. And so here's what we're going to do as a church, because it's the church's problem, because the government obviously can't fix it. We're going to give $4,000 to World Vision to make a difference over there where they want to live with their families. And I'm challenging our president now and our president who just left and every other president to take of your vast fortunes like we're taking from the fortunes we have given here. If, if one one-thousandth of Donald John Trump's fortune is $10 million, if he says he's worth $10 billion, give it, Mr. President. If, if $12,000 is one one-thousandth of your fortune, President, former President Obama, and you have $12.2 million, according, according to Money Magazine, give it to William Jefferson Clinton, Hillary Rodham Clinton, George W. Bush, all the way back. Be the example and give to be part of the problem. We're going to do it if nobody else does. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Go with God and get in a group. It's how we make a difference in this community and in your life too. God bless you.